It's a pleasure to introduce our, our first lecturer. He's a professor in physics, and he has a thriving research portfolio. This man researches gamma ray. <laughs> and he's part of the gamma ray astrophysics group at McGill, and he's a, a member of the Veritas Collaboration, which is a multinational group operating a newly commissioned detector in southern Arizona. He has traveled a lot to Arizona in the wintertime. I, I don't know exactly why, but he teaches the two largest undergraduate physics courses at McGill and has over a thousand students. In order to alleviate some of the problems with dealing with that, uh, that size of a group and the lack of engagement in these courses, he uses technology supported by supported learning strategies. Um, he also enhances student learning by integrating technology into his instructional strategies, such as interactive questioning and peer discussion, um, guided problem solving using a tablet PC, and he'll use that here today, hopefully. He d and he does demonstrations with a portable laboratory. Um, he was quoted recently in the McGill Tribune. It says, I went into physics because I had a great high school teacher who got me excited by it. Never underestimate the power of a single figure in a person's life. You're going to hear from him today, learning to teach, teaching to learn. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to introduce the recipient of the 2007 Physics Department Award of Excellence in Teaching, the inaugural award in this category, William C. McDonald, Chair in Physics and Most Innovative and Engaging Physics Instructor at McGill, Professor Kenneth Reagan. So, uh, I have to move on. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that uh, short, brief interlude for technology. Um, next question a pointer? Don't tell me I have to bring my own. Wait a minute. I have one here too. In fact, I have two. One of which undoubtedly doesn't have batteries. Okay, so you've already been introduced to the problems of technology and I'll talk more about them a little bit later as well. But for the moment, let me try and t tell you a little bit about sort of my approach to, to teaching. And um, you've already seen the rest of this slide, which is uh, originally I was given the title uh, to work with, which was learning to teach, that's the title of this workshop. And um, I kind of turned that around. I think really that it's more about teaching to learn and I'll sort of introduce that idea and uh, how I get from here to there. And I should say that of course this is uh, based on my experience in a large, in several large freshman physics courses. It doesn't necessarily translate I think to everybody's uh, experience or to everybody's uh, teaching, uh, teaching uh, uh, task, but uh, there are certain things I think that, that are fairly general. Okay, so uh, a little bit perhaps about me. Let me just uh, adjust the volume too. I sense that's too loud. Is that too loud in the back? Okay. The people in the back didn't make any head movement at all, so maybe it's not loud enough in the back. You'll adjust the volume. He'll adjust the volume. Okay. You know, in my undergraduate classes, I don't get this sort of, you know, live assistant, so it's really great. Okay. So my teaching background, first of all, I have no formal background in teaching in the sense that I w was never taught to teach. So by taking this course, you're already way ahead of me. If at my TA level, you know, m many, many decades ago, I had been given a course like this, I probably would have started out in a different way and I probably wouldn't have, would not have stumbled into a lot of the pitfalls that I stumbled into and ultimately that I hopefully got myself out of. So I don't have a formal background in that sense of being ever taught to teach. Instead, I've been teaching in the physics department of McGill for about 20 years, and so one develops a certain amount of, uh, for lack of a better word, expertise. Certainly um, comfort in front of classes, but also just sort of knowing what one has to do. Uh, to, uh, to put on a course. I've taught at uh, basically at all levels at this institution. I've taught at the freshman level extensively uh, through the under our undergraduate program, 200, 300, 400 level courses, graduate courses, sometimes team taught. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, of course, 
Uh, some of these courses have different components, lectures, labs, and tutorials. So I've, I've done a mix of all of this stuff. And recently, as Dave mentioned, for the last several years, uh, I've been uh, given large freshman courses to teach. I'll tell you a little bit more about them. They're typically in this uh, classroom right here, so I'm quite familiar with this classroom. I can count the steps to the top, blindfolded, basically. Um, I often wander, as you can see. And um, so I, uh, you know, I've, I've developed strategies for dealing with a class of several hundred students. You're, in fact, quite a small, intimate class uh, from, from, uh, from that point of view. And uh, I've taught a mix of... Um, physics-friendly and physics-hostile clientele, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that as well. Okay, um, through all of that, I think I've survived. I'm here. Uh, I've kind of prospered. I enjoy teaching, and that's something that didn't necess would, nece would not necessarily um, have been my first reaction if you'd asked me, say, a decade ago, that, you know, do you like to teach? Well, teaching was something I did because that was something that an academic does. Um, but I've grown to, to love teaching um, because of the interaction with students in spite of these large classes. Okay, let me, I've told you a little bit about me, let me uh, ask something about you. You've got uh, clickers hopefully with you, and with any luck the technology works, except that you're clicking now and the technology isn't working. Oh yes, there's responses. So all you have to do is click, click a button, hopefully one through nine. You can click it multiple times. It's like Chicago elections, vote early, vote often. But uh, unlike Chicago elections, it's only the last uh, click that is actually counted. Okay, so if you decide at the very last minute that no, you're really not in sciences, you're in management, go for it, okay? <laughs> so uh, two things this allows me to do. Well, several things actually introduce the technology to you. Many of you perhaps have not seen it. Count the number of people who are still awake and also get some information here. So, uh, Dave, an idea as to how many people I should be getting? Anybody know? Dave's gone, of course, gone for coffee. Okay, well, you know, it's like popcorn in the microwave when the response rate starts to drop and this number doesn't increase very much, you know, one per second you know that the microwave is, the, the popcorn is done, rather. So I'll, I'll go on at this point. I'm going to claim that there's 144 of you. And most of my jokes at this point will be either management jokes or uh, music, uh, music jokes, okay? Because uh, those, that way I offend the least number of people. Okay, as you can see, um, you know, quite, quite diverse. Art, sciences, education, management, uh, lots of scientists. Okay, that's good. Uh, what's this peak here? This is what, number six, so uh, lots of people in medicine. Okay, fantastic. And a smattering of others. Nobody here is at zero. Okay, that's, that's great. Um, how much teaching have you done? None, a few classes, many, regular classes, delivered most of at least one course, or been the primary instructor for at least one course. There's still seven of you. You see, now I can, I can tell. Ah, interestingly enough, it was 144 last time, and now it's up 147. So some of you are waking up. Good, okay, so let's move on. Uh, most of you, of course, are in the first two categories, none or just a very few number of classes. And uh, interestingly enough, there are a smattering of people who have been uh, primary instructor for at least a course, delivered most of a course. Okay, so it's, it's, a little bit, uh, it's a little bit mixed, but again, primarily here. And so the last question for the moment, at least how important was your teaching in getting you to where you are now on a scale of one to five? This is called a Likert scale, L-I-K-E-R-T. Not important at all, two, three, and four, or you know, some, graduated, uh, some graduated scale to being critically important. That could be a logarithmic scale if you want, that could be a linear scale. You take whatever you'd, uh, you know, you, you interpolate the scale the way you'd like. Okay. See how easy and Rapidly, this feedback comes. We'll talk about clickers more in a mo moment. So not important at all has the uh, plurality. If this was a Canadian election, this person would be sitting in the House of Commons, and this person would be appointed senator. Okay. Um, but some of you, actually, it's critically important. I'm, I'm impressed, actually. I, I was not ex 
expecting these sorts of numbers up here. Uh, I was expecting this to be more of a one-sided distribution way down here. Uh, anyways, again, a range. But the, uh, the mean clearly is below here. So these two are the highest, uh, the highest bins, so clearly the mean is in here somewhere. And so uh, for most people, I would say that it's not important or only modestly important. And that actually brings up a very interesting point in academia, and that is that very few of us are selected based on teaching. If you go back 20 years to when I was hired at McGill, and what they asked me about teaching, they said, are you okay with teaching? I said, yes, they said, you're hired, okay? There was some preamble about my research, etc. It wasn't quite that simple, okay? Nonetheless, teaching was really not something that I felt that I was selected on. Now, maybe they were just really, really good. They looked at me and said, you know, we could put him in a freshman class, you know, throw him to the wolves, okay? But in, it, it, in principle, or it, certainly I had the impression that teaching was not something I was selected upon. Now, I also sit on uh, hiring committees in my own department. We're hiring right now, as a matter of fact. We deal with teaching a lot more. We now ask would you really like to teach? And they say, oh, yes, oh, yes, now. And we say, you're hired. Okay. So it's a little bit more complicated. There's twice as many words as there were last time. But ultimately, we deal with people who are postdocs, who have very little teaching experience. We ask them about teaching. They say, yes, I'm interested in teaching. I like to teach. I think I would make a good teacher. We try to evaluate whether they would make a good teacher. We do that seriously. But ultimately, that we have, a, we have less information to go on there than we have to go on with the research portfolio of somebody. So in academia, few of us are selected based entirely on teaching, and teaching plays a secondary role in a lot of our hiring. And, and yet we're expected to teach. If you ask my family what I, does, what I do, <coughs> obviously not grammar, um, <laughs> what I do, they will generally say, well, he's a teacher. And I'll say, yes, but as you know, I spend a lot of time doing other things. Even to this day, 20 years later, many of my friends say, so it's the summertime, you're off, right? Uh, four, four months off. School's not in session. What can you possibly be doing? I I'm doing actually what I love to do, which is research. So we're not really selected based on teaching, and yet we're expected to teach. So learning to teach seems like a very, very laudable goal. But learning to teach seems to imply, and this is where I come back to my choice of a title, that there is a way to teach, that somehow teaching is like... Um, riding a bicycle, and that somehow you'll just learn it, and uh, away you'll go, but there's only really one, one way to do it. I, you know, nobody rides a bicycle on their head unless you work for Cirque du Soleil. Nobody rides a bicycle sitting backwards. People ride a bicycle in a very standard way. That's why the handlebars are called handlebars, and that's why the seat is called a seat, right? So is there a single way to teach? I'm not convinced that that's true, in fact. I think the focus should be on the result of teaching, which of course is the learning, and not necessarily on the process. And the process, in fact, can be adaptive such that you get to the result you want to get to. And the result you want to get to is that the people that you're talking to, if you're doing it in this very classic way, are coming away with the message you want them to come away with. So one of the first things I think we need to ask ourselves is, what do we want students to learn? So not necessarily teaching, uh, learning to teach, rather, but teaching to learn. Teaching so that the students come away with something that you have evaluated in advance, that you have ascertained in advance, that is what you want them to, uh, to, uh, to acquire in your course or in your lab or your tutorial or whatever. So what can we offer as the professors or the teachers or the TAs? What can we offer to the students? Well, we are, in principle, knowledge experts. That's what puts us where we are. Okay? I probably know more physics than the undergraduate classes that I stand in front of. Um, these days, that's, uh, that position is uh, increasingly challenged, although I think it's probably still true that we're the knowledge experts. There's a lot of information out there at their fingertips. I have been in classes in which I have said something, and somebody in the front row with their laptop open has said, that's interesting, Wikipedia says something differently than you do. Okay, me versus Wikipedia. Okay, well, that's actually a discussion that I'm willing to, you know, to, to, uh, to, um, uh, to take on at some level, and it turns out that Wikipedia was uh, not wrong, and I was not wrong, thankfully. Um, but uh, we were simply talking about slightly different cases. Anyways, this is increasingly uh, uh, the, uh, the sources of knowledge for students today, I think, are, are increasingly uh, diverse. 
but nonetheless, we're the knowledge experts. And so we can help to guide them through things like Wikipedia, but also through all sorts of other sources, through this thicket of, of new material. What we need to offer is a view of the forest, even as we're explaining the trees, even as we're explaining the details, we need to be able to offer them not just, I mean, Wikipedia has hundreds, thousands, millions of details, but what you perhaps don't get from the text and the images on Wikipedia is a view of the ensemble, a view of the forest, even as you know, Wikipedia is walking you through the trees. And above all, I think what we can offer is the passion and the enthusiasm that we have for what we teach. That's why we are where we are. I don't know, well, I now know actually, based on my, uh, on my quiz question, approximately which faculty you were in, but uh, I don't know your exact, uh, you know, your exact subject matters. But I know that because you're there, you're passionate about it. You're passionate about it. That's why you're there. That's why I'm in physics, because I happen to be passionate about physics. I know people who are in subject matters you know, all across the university. Every one of them is passionate about it. That's what puts us where we are. And that's what we can offer our students. And that's the primary thing, in my opinion, we can offer our students. We cannot offer our students 24-7 service in terms of understanding details. We can probably not even offer our students as much information collectively as they can find on things like Wikipedia. But we can offer the passion that we have, the way the pieces fit together, the way new pieces fit into these puzzles. So that's, I think, what we, what we really have to focus on and what we have to, um, have to think about. So, again, um, you know, learning is a very, very fantastic process, and I'm not an expert in learning in the sense of having a degree in education or anything like that. Um, it's, a, it's a very marvelous process. It's a very complicated process. I think all of us have experienced that moment where you understand something that has bothered you for a while, that aha moment. You perhaps have seen it in students. It's a fantastic thing to see when a student finally grasps a, to a, t uh, you know, a topic or a... Uh, a, uh, a concept that has been eluding them. Um, but I don't understand the process by which that occurs. What I do understand is that there are lots of different types of learners. There are lots of different types of people. There are people who learn primarily by seeing it done, by example, for instance, if you're working in, in something like physics that, can, uh, that, that has lots of problems. There are people who learn uh, by understanding basic concepts first and then working upwards. There are people who learn in, in lots of different ways. Uh, and uh, we have to strive to offer as much as we can to all of these students. So the analogy, I'm continually ch changing analogies on you, uh, of course, uh, through this uh, lecture, but the analogy here is that this has to be a smorgasbord, a buffet of possibilities from which the student can pick. So that if they've got, uh, if there are, they are problem people, if they want to do lots and lots of problems in order to understand the general rules, you give them lots of problems. If they want to see the general rules first, if they want to want to learn by doing, if they want to learn by seeing, we've got to give them as many possibilities as we can and offer them real smorgasbord of learning, and then let them pick out what works for them, because one size d certainly does not fit all, um, and, uh, and we really need to let them, especially at the university level, let them determine what is going to work for them. One thing we are blessed with at the university level is that this is not entirely a captive audience. In my physics courses, I like to believe that it's a captive audience in the sense that they're forced to take physics, but these are young adults that you're teaching. You're young adults, and you're going to be teaching slightly younger adults. But they want to be there. That's why they're there. This is not high school. This is not grade school, where my mom says, I've got to be here at 9, and I'm here at 9. These people want to be here, and so they're going to choose what works for them. You want to put as many possibilities as front of them, in front of them, I think, as possible. Now, they need feedback, and of course, so do you. And they're the best ones in a position to know what's working, so the easiest way to get that information, of course, is to simply ask them. Ask them what's working. Ask them what isn't working. Ask them what does work, what would work for them, what can be done so that they can get more out of what you're giving them. And I think this is an approach, this is an approach certainly that has worked for me in large classes, but I think this is an approach that works in labs, in TA set, uh, in uh, tutorial settings, basically in every setting. You can't do this 
ex too extensively, you certainly don't want to spend a large part of every class saying, you know, is this working, is this working, is this working? That becomes, uh, uh, that becomes just bothersome at some level. But I think periodically you want to ask whatever class you are, you are leading, whether it's a tutorial or a, uh, or a lab class or a lecture, you want to ask if, they're, uh, if in fact they're, uh, they're learning something and carrying away something. And, and sometimes the answer is no. You know, don't, don't ever ask a question, perhaps, this is, this is an old adage, don't ever ask a question to which you're not prepared for the answer. And the answer sometimes can be, you know, this isn't working for me. And then you've got hard work to do. You've got to dig down and say, why isn't it working for you? What can I do, potentially, to make it work? Now, there will always be the student who will say, well, it isn't working because I'm not going to get an A, and I want an A, so give me an A. Well, okay, now, as, you know, as educators, sometimes you have to sort of say, mm, okay, I see where you're going, but that's just not going to happen, okay? So there's, there's a moment of frankness on both sides, but a lot of times the students know exactly where they are and where they're falling down, and you can help them, and they can help themselves by helping you along. So for, for example, here's what I do in Physics 101. Physics 101 is the introductory non-calculus-based physics course, so algebra-based physics course, about half of this course has, uh, about half of the students have seen some physics in high school and about half of them have not seen any physics in high school. So the first or second class, I poll students on their level of physics, their feeling about taking physics, what they'd like to get out of the course. So their level of physics, uh, that is, academic level, have they taken it at high school and that sort of thing. Their feelings, you know, trepidation, fear, exhilaration, I would allow for a wide range of, uh, of uh, emotions. I would say that m the mean is somewhat uh, less challenging than, than uh, trepidation, but sometimes there is just downright fear. I don't, don't deny that. And then about a month into the term, I repull them what they like, what they don't like, and what could be done to improve their learning. So I'm asking them, look, is this working for you? Can you see progress happening? And if not, what can we do together? to make that progress happen. So here are some examples, just because I think it's kind of cool. Um, I give, typically, I summarize the examples sort of on a serious slide for them. This is a real slide that I've shown in Physics 101. You'll notice the color, change, color scheme has changed slightly. Um, these are the things that they actually like, the demos in class, in class examples. They love the clicker technology, and I'll come back to clickers in a minute. Um, Kappa is their online assignment system, which they learn to love and hate, typically. Notice that Kappa uh, ends up here, too. There, there are, Kappa has its own idiosyncrasies that we won't get into here, uh, being an online system, but uh, the students uh, focus on it sometimes. Anyways, what you don't like is, the, what they don't like is the, uh, what's happening here, the fact that the course moves very, very rapidly, and then here's a bunch of things that they'd like me to do differently, and I try hard to do those things, and every year, slow down, and talk more slowly are numbers one and two on the list. And you've probably already noticed that I can really get wound up sometimes and start to talk, and I do that with my physics classes too. So every year I have to try to really slow down. But the point is not that you know, I should know that in advance. The point is that I'm letting them give, me my, give them their feedback, and I want to look at that feedback, and I want to act on that feedback. It's not just feedback so that they can feel better giving me feedback, although that certainly works. It's also feedback to help me change what I'm doing. And I really do try to change these things, although sometimes not entirely. The really great ones, of course, are the ones that they give me that are somewhat off topic. So they give me these gems, you know, like what they like. Well, my colorful shirts. Okay, I, you know, I, my shirts are like everybody else's shirts, aren't they? Anyways, they tell me that. Uh, I haven't fallen asleep yet. Uh, my accent, Th every year I get this, about 25% of my course is Americans, and so they say they like my accent. Uh, oh, look, I don't have an accent, they have the accent. Anyways, they, they tell me that. And then this is my perhaps all-time best, uh, best uh, comment that they got. If only chemistry was more like this course. So I, I like to show that to my chemistry friends. Um, things they don't like, you know, red pen on the slides, not enough real-life apps like Pokemon battles. Okay, sometimes there's kind of a generation gap between me and my students, so sometimes I don't even understand the language they put down. Things I'd like to do differently, more dangerous demos, like jump off higher tables. Okay, and one time... I have to admit, at one time, I did actually jump off a table just to demonstrate a point, uh, and, um, and uh, so they obviously were awake that time. And then they give me these graphic gems, they, you know, things like this, more demonstrations. Here's, here's me, apparently, with a one-ton 
uh, block and can I open my eyes yet? That's a student, okay? I, I try to uh, Im embed students in my, there's Kappa and there's a, an unwitting student, okay? So, so they give me feedback and I, I, I use that feedback. So in particular, as a result of this feedback, over time I can see that this course has evolved. I've taught this course now four or five times in a row. Four, it's, it's a, a one-term course that I teach in the fall semester every year. I've taught it four or five times now. And, uh, and I can see the course evolve based on the, what the students are telling me. So what I do in particular is much more in-class problem solving. Okay? I didn't used to do any of that. I thought, well, there's really not enough time. I've just got to lecture in the classic way, the way I was taught. Well, no, that doesn't work for them. And so I now do a lot of in-class problem solving where we set up a problem and I will actually write on my tablet, and I'll show that in just a minute. I, you know, the, the technology is fantastic for that. And I can do the problem. And you might think that's unwieldy in a class of four or 500, but it works and they can follow it. They claim that it, it slows me down in my solutions and it allows them to see that sometimes I can do I can use alternate techniques to solve these problems. So it's, de it, it's good for them. It's demonstrating something I want them to take away from the course, which is the ability to attack problems in, in different ways. More in-class clicker questions, so the conceptual questions. They love the clickers because it allows them conceptual questions, and I'll show you that in just a minute. Many more demos in class, in particular high tables, of course. You know, uh, just as an aside for anybody who might be a physics person or even a chemist, I guess, um, the interest of students in demos is directly proportional to the risk or the perceived risk of the professor actually being seriously injured and potentially fatally injured, okay? That's a really successful demo if they think somehow that I might actually, you know, they, they may see my blood. That, that for them is, is a fantastically successful demo and they're on the edge of their seats and they're great. And of course, I try to have as few of those as possible as you might imagine. Uh, enhanced view of applets, video clips I use extensively for things that are too dangerous to try in class. Uh, I modified my tutorial schedule and do my own tutorials. Uh, and uh, I extensively modified the labs uh, because of perceived problems with them. So again, this is all based on student feedback. And again, the goal is to give students as many options as possible to enhance their learning. I, I really want this smorgasbord uh, to be available to the students and they can choose which parts work and which parts don't. So here's one thing I do, for instance. Wait, I won't, uh, I won't uh, let you do that yet. We'll come back to that. Let me show you the, the, the clip first that I show. So this is one that I do show in class. Um, I hope this is going to work. It's a, it's a uh, YouTube video. So here we go. Lawn Chair Launch, it's called. So here's a, well, Physics 101 student, I think. OK, in a backyard. That's not my phone ringing. And here's a, an unwitting uh, Physics 101 student as well. And you can see what's going to happen here. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so I think you've seen the essential. Uh, let's pause that. So let's go back here. I think I have to reset this current slide. And uh, now you can tell me is the physics of this clip realistic? So this is the sort of thing that I do. I'll, I'll let you vote, and we won't talk about the physics of it, but we could. Um, but this is the sort of thing that I use in my class where it's a combination of something that I obviously can't do with a conceptual question, and that gets them thinking not about how cool that YouTube clip is, but What's the physics there? How would I go about solving this problem of is this realistic? I have to make an estimate of the distance the person went, the mass, the angle of attack, the uh, distance that they were pulled back, how much force that took, how many friends were around that person in the chair. Well, there were two. There weren't five. It wasn't you know, 10 different linebackers all pulling, right? So they can make an estimate of the force that two people can apply. And hence, does that all work with the known laws of physics that we've, that we've looked at? So, 40 more of you should respond, and uh, you know, don't worry uh, about, uh, about whether, you know, whether you get it right or not. In fact, I won't tell you the right answer, perhaps. Yes, yes, and it happened to me. No, the physics just doesn't work. Or no, no one would be so dumb as to fall asleep with friends like that around. And I always get people who answer number four, incidentally. Okay, so here we go. 
Most of you think that the physics just doesn't work. We can talk about it over coffee. And some of you have friends that you don't really trust. Okay, so. Uh, oh, there's the, uh, there's the answer from a Real Physics 101 class. Okay, yes. Uh, yes, and it happened to them. No. So you can see that the general shape is very, very close. Okay, so from this point of view, you're actually very much like a Physics 101 class. Okay. So, let me, uh, I've only got a few minutes left, let me uh, talk to you a little bit about technology. Um, because you've seen various technologies that I do use here at work, and there's always a discussion about, uh, about technology and, uh, and about uh, how to embed it in the classroom. I think the bottom line for me, it's almost a fundamental principle, is that I'm not interested in technology because technology is cool. Okay? So people say, well, you could podcast that, or you could, you know, Twitter, all of that, you know, s reduce 50 pages of a physics chapter to 140 characters. Well, I probably could, that's true, okay? But does it add anything to the course? Does it help what I'm trying to do, which is to get students to learn? So don't use technology, at least that's my take, for its own sake. It's got to work, it's got to work for me, and it's got to work for my students. If it's not bringing anything to the students, then to me, that's... Uh, uh, not any, there's no value added and there's no reason to do that. And even if it's take, bringing something to my students, if the cost to me, and I'm not talking financial cost here, if the cost to me is high, then that will make me hesitate. And when I say the cost is high, I mean um, pain in the ass factor, okay? Primarily, okay? Excuse my language. In, in front of a class like this, a class of several hundred students, Technology's got to work, and it's got to work in five to ten seconds, okay? You can imagine what happens if it doesn't work, and you've got 500 students, all of whom have smart cell phones and wireless access and laptops. You lose your audience instantly. So the technology has got to be bulletproof, and it's got to bring something to the course. And so what I use is, well, as you've seen, PowerPoint, and that's incidentally not for everybody. I had comments from the last time I introduced a workshop like this about, you know, it was in PowerPoint and I would have preferred to see chalkboard sessions. There are such things as uh, smart chalkboards now called smart boards, and that's a fantastic technology. It's simply not possible in this classroom in a class of several hundred. But if I was teaching a phys an upper level physics class, if they asked me to go back and teach a 300 or a 400 level class, the thing that I would look at right now would be smart boards, where I can be at a chalkboard and yet take an electronic uh, an electronic uh, snapshot of that chalkboard at the end of the uh, at the end of the class or partway through the class. So PowerPoint for me is the way to go, but that's somewhat uh, governed by by the classes I teach. A tablet computer I use, so I can annotate it. Okay, F equals M A, for instance. So this is the way I do uh, in class problem solving. I set the problem up, but I don't solve it, and then I solve it in real time in front of them, and I ask them for their input. You know, here's a problem with a car passing a truck. The car is going at such and such a speed. The truck is going at such and such a speed. I ask them, how do we start this? What should I write down? How do I do these unit conversions? And I get feedback from them. They can see that I'm solving it in real time. They can see sometimes that I make mistakes. I make mistakes in my unit conversions because I'm human. I make mistakes and I screw up my equations. That's okay. They'll generally, there will be somebody in the audience that will correct me. If I get my, you know, if I say, well, F equals M over A, Somebody eventually will say, no, I don't think that's the right equation. So it's useful for them to see that even experts don't always get it right first time. So the tablet computer for me is, is absolutely uh, fundamental in the way I teach these large classes. So maybe not for everybody, but certainly for me it works. As you've seen, lots of apps uh, and video clips that for things that I can't do uh, easily in, uh, in a class, lots of demos. Uh, I uh, record all of my courses and put them onto our uh, WebCT or, or uh, whatever it's called these days, uh, course management system. I extensively use the course management system to uh, give them uh, both the lectures before I annotate them. So in other words, prior to the lecture, I, uh, I upload the, the, uh, the lecture notes so that they can see what they're, we're going to work through. A lot of them like to have that in front of them as we work through the, the material. And then after my lecture, when they are annotated with my solutions and whatever else I have to uh, I annotate them with, um, I then upload them a second time. And of course, student response systems, the clickers that you've already used. So that's the technology that works for me. Again, I think 
you don't you shouldn't take my technology you should find out what the technology is that works for the problem that you've got in a tutorial where you're discussing 17th century english history in front of 15 students and not physics in front of a thousand students you will probably want to use very different technology than i use but in all cases, the technology, I think, has to be there because it aids the learning process and so not because you know, it's just technology uh, for technology's sake. I would like to give a special mention, however, to the use of clickers. For me, you've seen the, the, the clicker technology in work now. Um, they, they do something that before clickers happened, uh, I had always wanted to get, and that is that instant feedback from students on how they're doing. Now, of course, for the last 20 years, you've been able, in fact, for much longer than 20 years, you've been able to ask a class, you know, how are you doing? Did everybody understand that? Okay? And you look around and you hope that not everybody avoids your eyes. Okay? So not everybody is avoiding my eyes today. But it's surprising how few responses you get if you actually ask a question. People don't like to stick up their hand. Okay? How many people would prefer to use your hands than clickers? How many people would prefer to use clickers than your hands? And those two numbers, notice that those two questions, the way I asked those questions, you had to choose one or the other, but not 100% of you answered, okay? In fact, I would guess just at a glance that it was about 60 to 70% of you that stick up your hand, stuck up your hands. How many people didn't put up their hands to either of those questions? Do you see? Those are the people that will answer with a clicker but won't answer, even if they're asked, are you male or are you female, or would you prefer I not ask the question, okay? So uh, there are questions where everybody should be putting up their hand for one of the two solutions, and yet not everybody does. Why? People are uncomfortable standing out in a crowd. This is a big, big deal at the undergraduate level, okay? People do not want to be perceived as being wrong. So. There's a lot of peer pressure. Oh, you answered, I, I noticed I was sitting two rows above you and I noticed you answered B and it was pretty obvious the answer was A. Are you dumb? You know? They don't, people don't like to go that way. Clickers, everybody buys into them first time. Okay? In fact, with TLS, we've done some controlled systematic studies in which they have counted the warm bodies in my classroom and looked at how many people answered my clicker questions. The number is 95% approximately. 95%. So instead of getting 20% response, you get to first order 100% response. It's fantastic to have that feedback. And it allows me to know, am I going too quickly? Have they really got the material? It allows me to give them conceptual questions so that they can see, ah, you know, here's, here's a, like a brain teaser. Am I, am I really getting this material? And here's something that I'll just... Um, introduced very briefly here, but I encourage you to go and look at Wikipedia or wherever else you can find information on peer instruction. There's a lot of it on the web. But peer instruction, the teaching of students by the other students, okay? Often what I do is I will ask them a conceptual question and I have deliberately rigged it so that it's quite tough. And so the answer will not all be, you know, 100% the right answer. In fact, ideally what I really want is to get two or three answers that are all equally probable. That is, people will respond 50-50 or 30-30-30 for three answers. And then I ask them, without giving them any more information, I ask them to talk to their neighbors and to convince their neighbor that the, the person was right and their neighbor was probably wrong. And of course, their neighbor is trying to do the same thing to them. They thrash it out. I give them two minutes in class. There's a very incredible noise level. And then I ask them and I pull them again. And in most cases, the answer has, has now standardized on the correct answer. And in fact, there is very good evidence and there are very good systematic studies that demonstrate that if you do that and you take a group of undergraduates in something like physics, although other uh, in other disciplines it works as well, and you ask them collectively a question to which none of them know the answer and you let them discuss it, they will usually figure out the answer because they will each bring different elements of what they've learned. One person will remember that F does equal MA. The other person will remember how to build a free body diagram. The other person will remember that the third law says equal and opposite forces. And together, they will piece together the answer to that problem. And so collectively, they've learned something. Collectively, they've learned that uh, that um, not just a factoid, they've, they've learned how to approach that conceptual question by talking about 
about it together. That's pure instruction. It's a very, very powerful technique. I've seen it work many, many, many times in Physics 101. And without the clickers, so that you know how people are doing, it would be much more difficult to do. So the peer instruction really doesn't entirely depend on clickers, but clickers is a very uh, a great segue into peer instruction. I should also mention that on Physics 101, we have a bulletin board through my courses, and that bulletin board is very active. I think in the first term of this year, uh, the bulletin board over the four months had something like 3,000 posts to it. Okay, so lots and lots and lots of people posting, and I monitor that, and, uh, but, but in fact, I, I don't intervene. I just monitor it, and I let students answer other students' questions, and I watch peer instruction, and I'm just amazed. It's absolutely incredible. You have students that will step up to the plate and will spend, obviously, hours understanding the material and then turn around and spend more time explaining it to others on that, uh, on that bulletin board. So again, pure instruction at work, and it's fantastic to watch. Okay, so the bottom line, I think I'm getting close to the end, and I'm also getting close to the end of my time. I think the bottom line is that it's not just about how to teach, it's about how are people learning. And I don't understand that process entirely, and I don't think anybody does, but the students are clearly the ones who know if they understand the material are probably the ones who know best if they understand the material. So you've got to respect them. You've got to listen to them. You've got to enroll them to help you. And uh, you've got to learn from them as to what works to get the message across to them. So uh, this smorgasbord of possibilities for students. Technology may help. I don't think it's a panacea, but I think it does help in a lot of cases. Uh, and uh, again, don't be afraid to show your passion. I think that's what we carry to this, is a passion for what we, what we like. And that can be in very, very effective, and uh, that can then really uh, can really excite students. So I think I'm finished here. Uh, I do have a few minutes for questions, if there are some. Go ahead. Yes. Um, uh, that's, that's a good question, actually. In, in the class like this, so, so the question, for those who didn't hear it, was peer instruction is great. You, you know, ask them a question, you deliver them to each other so that they discuss it, and then how do you get them back focused on you? Uh, in my large classes, uh, it certainly it helps that I then pull them again on, on the same question, okay? So that focuses them. And typically, when I do that, I then sort of count down. I give them several seconds, and I say, okay, I'm going to close the polling, and that focuses them back. And typically, by the time that finishes, the class is completely silent. There are times when it's a little bit more difficult to pull them back, but it's, it's not impossible. Um, uh, I've never really, it's uh, a very good question. I've re never really focused on that aspect of it. It's just sort of always worked for me. Um, can you give me any, uh, <laughs> any help as to how that worked? You've seen it work in my class as well. Sorry to put you on the spot, but uh, uh, I don't have the video. Maybe uh, eh, not easily. Technology has to work in seven, seven seconds. Otherwise, it doesn't work for me. Um, so there are videos, actually. So, so what, what I will say is that the TLS has, has, has looked at this and has watched the videos, and you can may, maybe I do something that I don't, I'm not even aware of. But it, the, the polling, I think, the, the asking for the question, again, really helps to focus them. So, so maybe that's the way to do it. Is, you know, even in a smaller class, you can, you can have that sort of an interaction where, okay, now I'm going to ask another question. Focus, please, on that question, and that'll bring them back. But that's a very good question. I don't completely understand that dynamic either. Yes? Yeah, right. So you want to you want to keep it short and sweet. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a good good point. So um, the the, uh, the way PowerPoint, uh, the way these uh, clickers here, the ones that you're using today, which are called Turning Point, and and it's only one of many 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 systems, but it's the one that McGill has standardized on. Uh, the way it is embedded into PowerPoint with its own package called Turning Point allows you actually to have a clock that ticks down 
to tell students how much time is left until polling closes. I don't generally do that because I like to be able to control that myself, but you can actually, the technology does help you to, to keep that time short if you want to. You can put in 30 seconds and away it goes tick, 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 tick. Um, good point. Other questions? Time. I've been told that it's time and there are no questions. So thank you very much again and have a great day.